junkie, burnout, crackhead, alky, drunk. This is how our society describes people struggling with addiction to drugs or alcohol. At best, it's, she's an alcoholic, or he is an addict. Imagine if we use this type of language with other diseases. She's a cancer. Ooh, he is a dementia. That boy is anxiety. But we don't. We say she has breast cancer, or he is in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, and the boy is struggling with anxiety. We don't even do this with addiction to other substances. Have you ever referred to someone who smokes cigarettes as a cigarette addict? Yet, in 1987, the medical community formally reclassified addiction as a disease, just the same as cancer, Alzheimer's, and anxiety disorder, to name a few. But our language has not kept pace with that, and it matters. Let me tell you about a woman I know named Jane. She's an upper-middle-class professional who has a master's degree, and she's a parent-teacher organization board member. Jane also has the genetic predisposition for addiction, and she battled codependency and low self-esteem her entire life. And on her 39th birthday, Jane found herself homeless, having lost her driver's license, and most painfully, her children. Jane was 100% physically isolated. Now, let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm a mom, a daughter, a friend, and a wife. I'm an MBA graduate, a marketing executive, and I volunteer in the recovery community. I'm a runner, an ex-Jersey girl. Oh, and I am someone who really loves pretzels. <laughs> I am about 150 different things to myself and to everyone in my life. And yes, as maybe you've guessed it, I am Jane. And at one time, as so many people reminded me, I believed that I was only an alcoholic. I have been sober and in long-term recovery or remission for coming on 10 years. But the feelings of those last desperate days, the days that I was almost at a point of no return, continued to teach me. My move into recovery wasn't neat. It was not pretty. I simply realized one day that I was literally at the point of dying, and I was not willing to leave that legacy for my sons. But not dying is not the same as feeling worthy to live. Negative labels like, she's a drunk, Rebecca is an alcoholic, made it very difficult. The shame of those negative labels had pushed me into emotional isolation long before my physical isolation. See, to get well, I had to treat my disease, not be my disease. I had to believe that I was more than just an alcoholic. Now, 
I had never believed that before in all my attempts to get sober. But I will never forget the moment in detox when someone said to me, Rebecca, you have a disease. You have alcoholism. It's not all of you. You just need to remember all the other pieces of you. In that moment of kindness and of clarity and of language shift, I was no longer just a negative stereotype. I was, in fact, a person, a woman, a daughter, a mom, and yes, someone who needed to take accountability for her actions and her disease. But being freed of a single negative label gave me hope, and that fueled my recovery. That language shift was part of saving my life. Words matter because they shape how we see an issue, how we see each other, how we see ourselves. They open or they close possibilities. We know this now when it comes to race, gender identity, and disability. But there needs to be a greater understanding about how words affect those struggling with addiction to drugs and alcohol. These so-called junkies and drunks, they're also moms and dads. They're sons of bankers and daughters of union workers. They're high school athletes, straight-A students, and dropouts. They're teachers and doctors, laborers and cops, Caucasians, African Americans, Asians, and every race within our borders. In other words, they're people just like you. But we don't talk about them like that. Instead, we reduce their identity to one negative label that suggests moral failing. We stigmatize them. The Office of National Drug Control Policy recognized this. In early 2017, it published a paper called Changing the Language Around Addiction, which reported that people with the disease of addiction are viewed more negatively than people with any other physical or psychiatric condition. And negative labels encourage blame. As the report makes clear, when someone is referred to as a substance abuser or an addict, even physicians and those highly trained in addiction treatment are more likely to blame the person with the disease. And worst of all, these negative labels are contributing to our epidemic of addiction by discouraging people from seeking help. The Hazelton Foundation confirms this. It reports that due to the fear of being stigmatized, only one in 10 Americans struggling with addiction to drugs or alcohol receive professional care. Let me repeat that. Only one-tenth opt for care due to fear of stigma. Language matters. Now, recognizing this, some media outlets like the Associated Press and some treatment centers did begin to shift their language. But more of us need to join the effort. Shifting the language we use around addiction is a simple but powerful way to support recovery. 
Instead of reductive or judgmental labels like junky and drunk or even alcoholic or addict, we could say, Dad has an opioid use disorder. John uses cocaine. Susan is struggling with addiction to alcohol. Neutral phrases that use verbs to separate the human being from the disease. Phrases that describe the problem without labeling the person. Imagine your whole identity reduced to one negative label. Someone freeing me from my negative label was an important, critical part of saving my life. So the next time you see someone struggling with addiction, please refer to the disease without labeling the person. It could help save their life. Thank you.